us here tonight. We're talking about heaven, and Randy Alcorn's book has been sort of our model. Uh, one of the things that I've heard from several that have been part of the study is that this whole idea of heaven and earth kind of being uh, ultimately the same place uh, that, that when God brings the new Jerusalem down, the heaven comes down, earth, that that's kind of a foreign concept to some people. And so I want to talk a little bit more about that tonight and bring in a few more scriptures for you to make reference to and to talk a little bit about what other theologians uh, have said about that particular concept and idea. Uh, because it is taught biblically. It's not something somebody just thought up and said, well, that's kind of a neat idea. It is, it's, it's a biblical concept that we unfortunately have not taught well, I think is the church universal. And so I, want to, I just want to take a little more time there, and, and then we'll talk about any questions you might have toward the end. Uh, before we do, this Sunday we're talking about the triumphant entry during the worship service, and Tom's Sunday school is going to be on. What does commitment look like? That's a good subject. Everybody should want to be a part of that one. Uh, so that's what's coming up Sunday. I'll remind you too about um, our Seder meal coming up in two Sundays from now. This Sunday's Palm Sunday, Easter Sunday morning. This will be set up for a Seder meal. Do encourage you to invite your unchurched friends to come be a part of that. If you know anybody with Jewish background, even if they're secular Jews, uh, this would be particularly informative to them because they'll be familiar with the rituals and, and may not understand exactly what all the rituals mean and what they, where they come from. Uh, I think it'll be a, a good time. Also, this coming week, uh, Pastor Tom is going to be writing an article in the paper about our Seder, and we're going to chat a little bit about that after this, this evening. So uh, we we'll, should have, and we're going to make it a point to say to people that if you've got a church home, stay at your church home. But if you, if you don't have a church home, you're particularly interested in this, come visit with us. I think Nancy told me we had, we, we've got enough tables to set up for about 130, I think's what it was, 130 some. So that would be like three times what we had here Sunday, and you know we were a little bit crowded Sunday. So with tables in here, that'll be a crowd if we have that many, but I'd love to have that many. So... Do invite your unchurched friends. Come be a part of this. I think it will be. And I've never, had, I've never done one of these that I didn't have somebody at the end say, I wish I had invited so-and-so because they would have really appreciated the things that were done and said. So do invite people to come be a part of the Seder meal. And I'm not moving. Okay. All right. So let's... Yeah, I'm going to have to back up. Something's not right there yet. Let me, let me try to. Let me try to. Okay. Okay, well, well maybe we'll get it going. Maybe. Um, <laughs> it's on delay, I think is what it is. Okay, what does God's creation and Jesus' mission oops, tell us about heaven. That's the subject tonight. What, what does God's creation and what does Jesus' mission tell us about heaven? Now we've already said, to, to try, try to give you a hint where we're going with this, we've already said that heaven can't be anything that God created that is outside of his character, his nature, and his attributes. So that should give you a hint as to what I'm asking here. So what does God's creation and Jesus' mission tell us about heaven? And then we've, we've also talked some about God's attributes, and one of the things we said is that God is immutable. Does anybody remember what that? He doesn't change. He, he is unchangeable. He doesn't change. And what Randy Alcorn's premise is, is this, and he never really states it as clearly as I would like for him to state it, so I'm going to try to help him out here. Um, 
that what God intended in the creation, in the perfection of creation in Eden, that he hasn't changed his mind about. That the premise is that God is going to have an Eden-like environment in the final heaven that will be what he, he intended it to be in creation before the fall. And we're going to talk a little bit about the fall tonight as well. So that's what I mean when I'm talking about creation. Okay, so let's talk about some, some big theological words. It was the incarnation, the atonement, and resurrection of Jesus Christ that brought redemption to mankind, Jerusalem and the earth. Okay, so let's, let's conjugate the verbs here a bit. Uh, what is incarnation? Okay, Jesus coming into this world, becoming man, incarnate, he became man. So it was in the incarnation, atonement, what is atonement? Okay, that he became our sin and atoned for our sin, paid the price for our sin, that's atonement. Okay, um, a resurrection of Jesus Christ that brought redemption, what is redemption? To buy back, it's like going to get something that you've pawned and you buy it back, you redeem it, you, you take it back. Uh, redemption to mankind, one, Jerusalem, two, and the earth. So, let's read that whole thing again now. It was the incarnation, atonement, and resurrection of Jesus Christ that brought redemption to mankind, Jerusalem, and the earth. Christ's mission was to reclaim and set free not only the earth's inhabitants, but the earth itself. He came not only to redeem mankind as individuals, but also as nations and cultures. We've talked about that. And to redeem not only the work of his own hands, i.e. the forests of Lebanon and so forth, but the works of his creatures' hands, the ships of Tarshish. We, we read that scripture where he says, I'm going to reclaim the ships of Tarshish and these things that were actually created by God's creation, and that he wants to redeem those for his glory. So anything that was perverted, used, uh, used in a perverse way, it's God's plan to redeem that for its proper use and for his glory. Okay? So that's, that's God's plan. And it does, it, we often think of just redemption as being only about me. He's going to redeem me, and he's going to redeem Carol. But we don't think of it as being the redemption of his entire creation. And yet that's what we're told biblically. We're going to see that tonight. So let's look at a couple of theologians here. A.A. A. Hodge, well-known theologian, says it really eloquently. Uh, he says, heaven as, an, as the eternal home of the divine man and all the redeemed members of the human race must necessarily be thoroughly human in its structure, conditions, and activities. This heaven, he says, must out of necessity be thoroughly human in its structure, conditions, and activities. Its joys and activities must all be rational, moral, emotional, voluntary, and active. There must be the exercise of all the faculties, that is, our faculties, the, the uh, gratification of all tastes, the development of all talent capacities, and the realization of all ideals. Now that is a mouthful. I, I, t I tell you, you could go back and just take this right here, study this for the next month, and you're probably not going to get to the depths of it. There's, there's a whole lot said right here. But essentially what he is saying is God created us in a particular way, that we might bring him glory. When we were saved, we, were, we were only had to be saved because of the fall of man. Everybody understands that. If man had never fallen, there would be no need for our salvation. We would already have a perfect reality, which will be like our future heaven is going to be. So this 
heaven is going to be very much like what God intended to begin with. That is a perfect creation in which, in which we, we serve Him and we serve Him to His glory and that in the, in the process of our serving Him, we are gratified. We find gratification and we find enjoyment and we find real fulfillment because we are using what God created in us to do the very thing we were created to do, which is to bring Him glory. So that, that's the idea here, is that these things, these conditions, he says, our activities uh, will be thoroughly human. Uh, it's, it's joys and activities must be all, all be rational. Why? Because God is a rational God. It must be moral because God is a moral God. It must be emotional because we, cr we were created as emotional beings. Uh, it must be voluntary. Why? Because we were created with free will. Our free will, though, will be fulfilled perfectly because we will be doing what we were created to do, and our free will will be in perfect alignment with God's will for us. Uh, and as Christians walking in this world, let's just talk about that a minute. Because that's, that's really the, the whole focal point of sanctification. As we, as we were becoming more and more and more like Christ, that we are, in our very nature, becoming more and more servants of the living God. And as we do that, and we are being sanctified, our fulfillment is being, uh, is being raised. Our fulfillment level, our capacity for that fulfillment is even increasing. So that in this life, we, we never really reach that full capacity of fulfillment for the human being. Why? Because every time that I'm about full, God gives me more capacity for fulfillment. And as we, are, as we never find that in the things of the world, we never find them in the pleasures of the flesh. We never find them, uh, I hate to say this to a bunch of Baptists, but we never find it in good food. Uh, we, we, don't, we, don't, we don't find it in anything but bringing Him glory and serving Him well. And that's, that's how we're fulfilled. And so that capacity is going to grow. It has to be voluntary and active. Uh, I think a, a reason that we've already heard testimonies on several of the videos that I've shown of people that say, well, I, I think it was Greg Laurie that said, I know a pastor friend that said he wasn't looking forward to heaven because he, he, he envisioned it as just sort of a passive uh, place of just constantly being on his face before God. And, he's, and he's, nowhere in the Bible do we see that. We see activity and joy and, and fulfillment uh, all being lived out. And that's how uh, the Bible presents the, the, the heaven that God has created for us. It says there must be an exercise of all the faculties, the gratification of all taste, the development of all talent, capacities, and realization of all ideals. So that's Hodge. Now, there's no way you're going to get that tonight. I've already said that. So go back and watch this video. Stop it here. Read the screen. Uh, Take some time to think about this because this really, this whole concept of Hodge concerning heaven is right on in terms of its biblical application. He wants us to understand this is what heaven is really like. Okay, now this is uh, from Randy Alcorn. So let me, let me just state that up front. He says, the reason the intellectual curiosity, the imagination, the aesthetic instincts, the holy affections, the social affinities and the inexhaustible resources of strength and power native to the human soul must all find in heaven exercise and satisfaction. Then there must always be a goal of endeavor before us, ever future. That there, To think that there's just nothing to do in heaven is just the wrong concept of heaven. That there's constantly this goal, there's something that we're growing in, there's some some gaining of knowledge of God. There's some relationship with Him that's blooming, uh, with each other that's blooming. So all of that is very dynamic and, and uh, it, it's active. Uh, there must always be a goal and endeavor before us ever future. Heaven will prove 
the consummate flower and fruit of the whole creation in all history in the universe. Uh, Martin Lord Jones says, everything will be glorified, even nature itself. And, and by the way, if you don't know the name Martin Lloyd Jones, you need to get familiar with him. Uh, great theologian, great preacher. Uh, he's one of my favorite authors. All of us have authors that we can kind of relate to. I, I love to read Martin Lloyd Jones. One of the books I recommended to you this past Sunday on spiritual depression is by Martin Lloyd Jones. Uh, he says that what we call heaven is life in this perfect world as God intended humanity to live it. When we put Adam in paradise at the beginning, Adam fell, and all fell with him, and meaning that all humanity fell. So let, let's just let's do a little theology here. I know we're not supposed to do theology in church, but we're going to anyway. Uh, that was a joke. Uh, Adam, in theologians' words, was the federal head of mankind. When Adam fell, all of creation fell with him. So when Adam fell, we have a genetic predisposition to sin. We all inherited the sin of Adam because of Adam's fall, because he was the federal head. Of mankind. Now that's a big subject and you, there's volumes written on just the federal head of mankind. But in essence when he fell the whole creation fell with him. Uh, his choice to sin was that punitive and that powerful. Um, so when we put Adam in paradise at the beginning Adam fell and all fell with him but men and women are meant to live in the body and will live in a glorified body, in a glorified world, and God will be with them. Glorified body, glorified world, glorified universe, because all the universe fell, uh, in a glorif in, with God, which is a glorifying relationship. So real bodies, glorified bodies, we're told in the Bible that when we breathe our last breath, we will, we will see him and we will be as he is. What does that mean? We will have glorified bodies when our bodies are resurrected in newness of life. So that glorified body in a glorified world, what does a glorified world mean? We've talked around the edges of this. God's world, perfect world, yeah. Restored. That, there's one of those re-words we've been talking about. It's restored to what it was originally intended to be before the fall. Uh, and we're going to talk about what that condition looks like. Why? What was the event after, after the fall of man that precipitated a fallen world? I'm thinking of the curse. The, the cur God cursed the earth. He cursed the world. Uh, and he, you know, he said, you'll, you'll eat by the sweat of your brow. We're going to talk a little bit about what that, what that was all about. But again, reading some Martin Lloyd-Jones when you have an opportunity. When Adam and Eve fell into sin, Satan appeared to have ruined God's plan for the righteous, under uh, undying humanity to rule the earth to God's glory. That was God's plan. Undying humanity to rule the earth for God's glory. So when Adam fell, Satan probably looked at that, and all evidence is that he looked at that and thought, I win. I win. Just like when he looked at Jesus and he put him on the cross, he thought, I put him on the cross, he thought, I win. Of course, we know the other side of that and he knows the other side of that now but at the time that that was going on it's like the temptation when right after Jesus was baptized and he goes off in the wilderness and Satan tempts him with all the things he tempts him with uh, did he really believe that Christ would take that route probably probably I mean he I'll give you I'll give you all this kingdom all you have to do is just want just once fall down and worship me Yeah, he was, he was fully God and fully man. And I think sometimes we don't, we, 
We, we have a hard time as human beings getting our, our arms around that, but he was fully flesh as well, fully man, fully God. And so he did have, there's a whole, there, there's again volumes written on whether Christ could really be tempted. There's the side that says, well, no, he couldn't be tempted because he was God. And there's a side that says, well, if he couldn't be tempted, then there never was really a temptation. So, it, yeah, he, he, had to, he had to be able to succumb to the flesh to genuinely be tempted. But we know because of his godliness that he could not sin. So both of those things are true. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And, and that's right. And that that's that's good theology. That's 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 good stuff. Uh, that'll preach. <laughs> Undying humanity to rule earth. To God's glory. Yet immediately after the fall, God promises a redeemer. Immediately after the fall, God promises a redeemer. The seed of the woman who would one day come and crush the serpent. That's Genesis 3.15. This uh, Anthony Hokema is, um, he's a contemporary guy who, who, who is quite good, and uh, writes some stuff that will really make you think about some of these things in a deeper way. And he says, uh, concern, since the results of sin had been death, the promised victory must somehow involve the removal of death. So think about that. If, if, if the fall precipitated death, there was no death prior to that, then the re reclaiming, renewing, restoring of, of creation has to eliminate death. So that reality is going to be true for those in heaven and those in hell. Those in hell will live eternally. Those in heaven will live eternally. Yes. And so right, right from Genesis 3, we have the promise of Christ coming again. We have the promise of the Messiah. So in other words, God didn't waste any time fulfilling his, what he knew his ultimate plan was going to be. Did he know man was going to fall? Yeah, absolutely. He knew man was going to fall. But he gave him the opportunity anyway, and he had free will to make the choice he did. Okay, so further, since another result of sin had been the banishment of our first parents from the Garden of Eden, from which they were supposed to rule the world for God, it would seem that the victory should also mean man's restoration to some kind of regained paradise. Remember, Eden means paradise. It's, uh, it's this perfect place from which he could once again properly and sinlessly rule the earth. That's... God's plan was for man to rule and reign in the earth for his glory. And, and that restoration is going to eliminate uh, the, the possibility of sin and we will properly and sinlessly be able to serve him. Okay, back to Genesis 3.15. In a sense, therefore, the expectation of the new earth was already implicit in the promise of Genesis 3. The new earth is implicit in what he promised us in the redeem, in the redemption. So he's going to redeem not only us as human beings, but all of creation with it. 
Okay, let's look at some scripture. Matthew 25, 34. Get rid of my sound here. Come you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. What is our inheritance? Eternal life. Heaven. The inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. This is God's original plan. God's original plan. Because, because we're on a side road here, we're on a detour but because of the fall of man, doesn't mean God's kingdom's not going to be restored. And so this restoration, he says, is taking place, and it's planned for us since the creation of man. So what is the inheritance Jesus speaks of? Let's look at what Alcorn says. Just as the children of kings inherit kingdoms, and kingdoms consist of land and property, so earth is human, humanity's God-given property. God hasn't changed his mind. He hasn't fallen back to plan B or abandoned what he originally intended for us in the creation of the world. That's a pretty good synopsis of what I said earlier. Yeah, that's hallelujah. So, God's, oh boy, this thing's on delay again. Sorry about that. There we go. So let's look at some hymns. You know, hymns used to be, and thankfully I'm glad that some of the new uh, praise music is coming back to this, good theology. Good theology. You, you could go to a singing when my grandfather was growing up, and you, you could get the whole message in an evening of singing because you were going to get good theology. The, the old-time hymn writers. So let's look at just one hymn. Uh, this is my Father's world. Expresses the idea that we've been talking about in its final words. It says this, Jesus who died shall be satisfied and earth and heaven be one. Jesus will be satisfied and earth and heaven will be one. That's God's plan. That's God's original plan. He hasn't changed his mind. Well, I hope I don't have to restart this thing. Let's see. There we go. Ephesians 1.10 demonstrates that this idea of earth and heaven becoming one is explicitly clearly, perfectly biblical. You know, I've had, I've had people since I started the study already argue with me over this, this whole thing. I'll say, well, you're arguing with the Bible. You're just arguing with what God's Word says. It's, it's not, because I, I didn't make this up. I didn't think of this. I'm just not that good. <laughs> you know, this is, this is what, what God's Word says. Christ will make earth into heaven and heaven into earth. They will become the, the one universe, everything in it, will be brought back into perfect union as God originally intended it to be. Anything that's been out of kilter since the beginning will be made right. Just as the wall that separates God, I like this. This is, uh, I think this is Alcorn too. Just as the wall that separates God and mankind is torn down in Jesus, so too the wall that separates heaven and earth will be forever demolished. There will be one universe with all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, Jesus Christ. That's some amen words there. That's some amen words. Yeah, exactly. So here we are. Through Christ's redemptive work, he disarmed the powers and authorities and made a public spectacle of them, triumphing, triumphant, triumphing over them. Colossians 2.15. Hebrews 2.14. His death stripped Satan of ultimate power. There's, there, 
Satan has, has been given leeway, rule and reign in this world as it is right now. But he's on a leash. And there's an end to that leash. And it's, uh, we're told in, in God's word that one day he and, and, and all that, that have worshipped him will be thrown into the lake of fire. Everything that's corrupt is going to be thrown into the lake of fire. And then the earth and heaven are going to be restored. 1 John 3.8, the Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. Now, I think I've got this next quote up here. Note, yeah, note that it says, Christ came not to destroy the world he created, but to destroy the works of the devil. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't say he was coming back to destroy the world, but to destroy the works of the devil which were to, tw were to twist and pervert all things made good by God. Everything God had made, Satan's attempt is to twist and pervert that into something that it's not. Can't do this without some theology here. Um, uh, what is sin? Missing the mark. Harmatiology is the Greek word to miss the mark. Okay, that's one type of sin. There's four types mentioned biblically. But what is sin in general? Okay. That's exactly right. So now let's ask it this way. Is sin substantive? Is it, is it, like, is it, is it like material? Is it like matter? Is it... Is it something that exists in and of itself? Think about what the definition was that she just gave. This, this, this is some thinking stuff here, but th this will cause you to think about sin correctly. To miss the mark. To miss the mark. You're getting there. That's it. Okay, so to answer the, my question, go ahead, David. Okay, anything that is not perfection. Okay, now we're getting real close. Okay, so anything that is not in God's perfection, if it is imperfect, if it misses the mark. In other words, sin is, you remember the word? Sin, sin is, is that which is not godly. So, any, it is not substantive. It is, it is anything that is not good and holy and righteous. In other words, if I'm not meeting God's standard for holiness, if there's any part of me that's not meeting that, and there is, that's sin. So sin in and of itself is not something. It's not something that creeps around out there. There's a whole lot of bad theology that's going, well, there's this sinful thing behind every bush. Well, sin exists in the world, but sin is something that is not. It's not good. It's not holy. It's not righteous. It's not pure. It's not godly. So sin is not substantive. It's to miss what God gave us that is substantive. To, it, it, is, it is simply not to meet up with God's standard. It is harmartiology to miss the mark. The word harmatiology is, is the picture of an of a, of a, uh, archer that draws back his bow and he shoots toward the target and it either falls short or it goes astray. It, harmatiology. Uh, I had a... Excuse me? No, no. Harmatiology just means to miss the mark. You, uh, yeah, we're, that's a totally different area. We don't want to go there. 
Not tonight. We will go there eventually, but not tonight. Uh, it simply mi- means that we fall short, we miss the mark, we're, we're, we're not hitting the bullseye, but it's something we're not doing. It's not something that's substantive. Devil's tool is to pervert what is good and holy and right, is to take that the center of that target and twist it around and make it something filthy and dirty out of something that is very good. So that is it's a missing of something. It's not something that's, that's got substance. And I, I hope you'll think about that because it's not... There's some books written a few years ago. I, I won't mention the author's name tonight, but I, I did a whole series of messages for a group of pastors on the Navajo Reservation some years ago about this guy. And his whole idea is that sin is substantive and it's sort of hiding behind every bush waiting to attack you. Uh, that's not what sin is. Sin is to miss what God has the best for you. And when we get to heaven, this heaven that we're talking about, there is none of that. There's no possibility of missing the mark. There's no pars- possibility of, of having something perverted or twisted in your sight because you're going to be able to see it perfectly. Yeah. So, we're going to be a whole lot better from now on. <laughs> you got it, baby. You got it. I think you figured this out, David. <laughs> Glorified bodies, glorified beings. We will be as he is, and there will be, in, in the, the essence of that is this, that we will, we will see things as he sees them. We will understand things as he understands them. We, will have, we, will have, uh, we won't have perfect knowledge. I've, we've already talked about the fact that I think we'll be growing in our knowledge, and that's, that's part of the joy of our, of our existence in heaven but we will have a perfect perspective of the knowledge we gain. And that's, that therein lies the difference. Right now we don't have that. Somebody says something, I receive it one way, Jane receives it another way, David receives it another way. We all heard the same words from the same person at the same time, but we received it a different way. Why? Because our perspectives are different on that. The Native Americans have this exercise where they bring young boys in normally 12, 13 years old, they sit them in a circle and they take an eagle feather and they put it in the center of the circle and they say, now without using the word eagle or feather, describe what you see and they go around. And of course, everyone's seeing it at a little bit different angle and they describe something totally different. We see from a different perspective, but one day we will see with godly perspective all of these things in reality of the way they are, really are. And, and the way they really are, the way they were meant to be, will bring God glory. Why? Because evil is not substantive. It is just the perversion of that which is. God, everything God gave us was perfect. Man fell. Sin came into the world. Sin came into the world, and the sin says, don't do what God says. Don't go where God says go. Don't, don't believe as God says believe. Don't trust him. Sin is the don'ts, the nots. The, the, the lack of substance, the lack of things that are good. No, there's no, there is no tearing. There is, it, is, it is awe and wonder. It is that perfection that causes us to look at those things that God has created and go, wow. That's, that's truly awesome because now I'm seeing it from a godly perspective instead of from this fallen human perspective. We'll not have the capacity to sin. We'll have no desire to sin. Your, your, yeah, your, your being will be. We'll have no capacity for sin because there, there is no sin. Your, your, your renewed, restored body, mind, and spirit has but one thing that's going to that's going to bring you fulfillment and joy and that's bringing him glory and and sin doesn't figure into the equation anymore yep so we do lots of uh, um, I've always said this to look at it from a God perspective that I do see two ways that God does that he's done mm-hmm. but we walked in the garden and got done
when you draw your last breath. That's, that's, that's called glorification. That's three stages of, of being saved, of salvation. There's justification, what Christ did for us. The day that he died on the cross, he paid the price of our sins. We are justified before the Father. Legally, we're, we're, we're justified before him. We're sanctified in this world. We're being sanctified in this world, but that's a process. It's not an event. So we're being sanctified in this world, and the objective of every Christian should be able to walk closer and closer and closer to Christ to where I'm becoming more and more like him every day. The reality is that our lives don't normally, though, look like this. They look more like this, you know. But, the, but, but that's the objective of sanctification, that we're becoming more and more like him. The day we draw our last breath, God says that's glorification. We become as he is, and that we draw our last breath that's when we are going to be with him in perfection. Now, we've already made the distinction between the present heaven and the future heaven. We're talking about now the future heaven where the body is actually a part of the scene. There's the debate we talked about before about whether there's a, a temporary body now. I don't personally think there is. I think our, our, the day that we draw our last breath, if it's before Christ returns, where our spirit is with him. Our soul is with him. The day that he comes back and all of this is restored, bodies, we're told the dead in Christ will rise first. They will meet up with him in heaven. The dead in Christ will rise. They'll be reunited with their spirit and soul. They will have that new body, that newly regenerated body. And then those who are yet alive will go to be with him in the air. So in that transport, that transfer between here and there is when we'll receive our glorified bodies if he should come tonight before we leave here, and we all are breathing when he does. That's, that's the reality of that. Now that is a premillennial, pre-tribulation view of all of this. That's where I am. I'm pre-mill, pre-trib. Now we can talk that theology if you want to, but there's, there's people that are Christians that believe differently than I do. That is the predominant view that I have. Uh, it, is, it is the predominant view in the Southern Baptist world. Uh, and it is a predominant view, I think, now among all evangelicals, even outside of the Southern Baptist world. Uh, yes, pre-trib. Pre-millennial pre-trib. Okay, don't have time to do all that tonight, but hopefully we'll come back to that. Okay, note that Christ came not to destroy the world he created, but to destroy the works of the devil, <clears throat> which were twisted, perverted, and ruined what God had made. It is Satan's desire to destroy the world. So not God's desire to destroy the world, but to destroy that which Satan has perverted. God intended is not, intent is not to destroy the world, but to deliver it from destruction. So that's, that's his ultimate objective, and it will be fulfilled. No longer will there be any curse. Now there, we're going to talk about the curse just for a few minutes. Whew, boy, we're not going to have long to talk about it. Okay, let's see. Um, what would our lives be like without the curse? If the curse was lifted tonight, what would our lives be like? What, what would be different? It would be heaven. But what would be different? What would be the things that we would notice different around us if the curse was lifted tonight? No aches and pains. No aches and pains. Praise the Lord. No illness. No crabgrass. No crab <laughs> That's right. Elvis says amen. <laughs> Uh, no, okay, so you're, and, and that's getting really close to where I'm, we're going to go with this. What else? The lion laying down with the lamb. Lion laying down with the lamb. No more meat eaters. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and we'll actually love that. No more meat eaters. Uh, one day we will know firsthand, but even now there is much to anticipate. After Adam sinned, God said, cursed is the ground, the earth, because of you, because of the fallenness, because of the sin. And when the curse is reversed, we will no longer engage in painful toil, uh, engage in work that we're not fulfilled by and enjoy. Uh, it'll be a satisfied, satisfying caretaking. Now, we've already talked about in Genesis where it says he will tend and keep he put Adam in the garden and told him to tend and keep it. 
And I've said to you before, those words tend and keep have to do with praise and worship. Now, if you, if you can think this way, in the garden, there is no painful toil in the Garden of Eden. So Adam's work is not toilsome, it's not bothersome, it's not, it doesn't cause him to fret, it's not something he, he doesn't look forward to. He is fulfilled by what he is doing there and what he is doing in the garden and bringing about its care, its tending and keeping, is praising and worshiping God. That very act of service of tending and keeping is praising and worshiping God. Why? Because that's how God created him and what he created him for. So, this removal of the curse removes the crabgrass, the toil and the pain, uh, the insects that eat up all your plants. Uh, the insects will all get along together. They'll be like lions and lambs. They don't eat your plants anymore. And they don't, they don't come and buzz around your face anymore and all those kind of things. Um, when the curse is reversed, we will no longer engage in painful toil, but we'll enjoy satisfying, caretaking, praising, and worshiping. No longer will the earth yield thorns and thistles, defying our dominion and repaying us for corrupting it. The corruption came as a result of the fall. This, the fall causes the curse. The curse it causes the thistles and the, all the things that cause man to have to eat by the sweat of his brow. Now it's not, it's not sustenance that we're working for, it's God's glory that we're about. It's, his, it's bringing him the glory that we're totally about. And everything we're doing, everything we're enjoying, is going to be for the, for the glory of God. Now, we don't think that way because most of us weren't brought up to think that way. We go over here and we do things we enjoy and then we come to church. Everything we're going to be doing, everywhere we are, is going to be for the glory of God. And we will, that's how we will be most fulfilled, most enjoying our living every day. So there's nothing corrupting it. That's what we talked about, the corruption. The, the sin being the absence of that which is good. That's what sin really is. It's, it's something that's not. It's the absence of something that's good. No longer we will return to the ground from which we were taken. There's no more death. Uh, swallowed up in death as unrighteous stewards who ruined ourselves and the earth. Okay, let's look at Hokema one more time. Because of man's fall into sin, a curse was pronounced over this creation. God now sent his son into this world to redeem that creation. Not just mankind, but the creation, all of creation, from the results of sin. The work of Christ, therefore, is not just to save certain individuals, not even to save an innumerable throng of blood-bought people. The total work of Christ is nothing less than to redeem this entire creation from the effects of sin. That purpose will not be accomplished until God has ushered in the new earth, until paradise lost has become paradise regained. That's put very, very well. So, the restoration of the old earth to the glory of God, new earth to new heaven, all of it being one, not just something that's kind of a conglomeration of this that came down from heaven and a restored earth, but all of it is one, and we're living right in the middle of it. That's the biblical view of heaven, and it's in its perfection. There is no imperfection. There is... The, the absence of good does not exist. Because what's the absence of good? Sin. So the absence of good does not exist. The absence of anything that's holy does not exist. Everything that is, is for the glory of God. Now, we, I've, I've talked a lot about this since I've been here, but we cannot talk enough about the fact that that is our purpose, to bring God glory. That's our purpose in this world. That is what we were created for. That's how we were created. That's how we were designed. That's how we were 
made to be fulfilled. And the thing that hurts me as a pastor, more than anything that, that I might go through ac academically or technically in a church or some of the challenges that happen in a church, the thing that stresses me more than anything else is to see people in the church that are faithful, maybe even going through the motions of just doing things that never really enjoy bringing God glory. And they never are really fulfilled as Christians. And one of my great objectives here is to help every single person find their spiritual gifts, come to know what it is God has called you to do, and then see you bloom and blossom in that to fulfill that which God's called you to do because in bringing Him glory in that way, you will receive more fulfillment, more joy, more the love of God expressed through you than in any other time in your life. And yet, we as Christians, I think particularly in America, rarely ever get there. I want to see every one of you get there and enjoy that and have that relationship with God that allows you to see God working through you in ways that you, you look at and go, I know that's not me. I know that's not the flesh. I know I can't do what God just did through me. And you stand back in awe and wonder and are just amazed that God would choose to use you in that way. And then you're going to get a little glimpse of the heaven we talked about tonight. Those are the glimpses. I call them holy glimpses. Those little, little glimpses of heaven that God gives us on earth that allows us to see him working through us to bring him glory. Amen? Amen. Pastor.